Hi, Misfits. This is Kevin. And this is Kate. Welcome to Horror Wood. Do do do. Thanks for walking over on this rainy, gross day. Yucca. It's Yucca. gross. <laughs> it's gross outside. It is. Although, I'm actually okay with it. It's not, like, icy anymore. That's, and that's true. a dream. That's true. Thanks for having Matt on last week. Of course. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, listeners. I had a work trip. I was in Florida. Before we recorded. Before and then we you recorded. fell asleep. And then I was asleep. <laughs> It was one of those days, so thank you. Of course. I'm back. Oh my goodness, you're back. Back, back, back. Anyway. Oh! (laughs) (laughs) That got so serious. So serious very quickly. Oh my. (gasps) Okay, well, I'm ready for it. Are you ready ready for it, Kate? I'm ready to sit back and hear a story. Okay. It is a, it's a story, all right. Let's get into it, y'all. All right. All right. So today we embark on a magical journey through the life of one of the most influential figures in entertainment history. Mm. The man behind the magic, Walt Disney. Yes. Walt was a pioneering American entrepreneur, animator, film producer, and creator of one of the most renowned entertainment companies in the world. I can't think of anyone else in history who can claim that they have done the kind of things he's achieved. Mm -hmm. And with this level of greatness comes heaps of conspiracies, accusations, and the quote-unquote airing of dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. The second part of this episode is going to delve into instances where Walt Disney and his company may have had some issues. Disney's story begins on December 5th, 1901 in Hermosa, Chicago, where he was born Walter Elias Disney to Irish parents, Elias and Flora Disney. Flora, Flora. I like that name. Elias was a farmer, carpenter, and construction worker that was born in Ontario, Canada, Hmm. and later moved to the United States with his family. Flora was born in Steuben County, Indiana, and married Elias in 1888. What's interesting is the two actually met in the town of Akron, Florida. Elias was working as a building contractor there, and Flora was a school teacher. So Elias and Flora moved to Chicago for economic reasons in 1890. Okay. Elias was seeking better job opportunities and hoped to improve the family's financial situation. In the late 19th century, Chicago was a rapidly growing city with expanding industries, including construction and other manual labor fields. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that was like prime time to move here. A hundred percent. Walt was the fourth of five children in the Disney family. Here's the kids. Herbert, Raymond, Roy O, and Ruth. And also Walt, of course. Okay. Uh, Just a heads up here that Roy O would later become a crucial partner in the establishment and growth of the Walt Disney Company. Okay, Roy O. Roy O. Roy played a significant role in the business and financial aspects of the company. Okay. Uh, The family didn't stay in Chicago for very long after Walt was born. Mm -hmm. His parents were from small towns and they wanted to return to that way of life. The Disney family moved to a farm in Markline, Missouri. Oh, I've never even heard of that place. I know. It's, I think it's a very rural area. Okay. From there, they moved and settled in Kansas City, mm. Missouri, after that. But they bounced around. Here, this is bouncing around. They returned to Chicago in 1917 because his father, Elias, bought stock in the Ozell Company, which was a jelly company. A jelly company? Jelly. And so I'm thinking that was like petroleum jelly. I, I don't think oh, that. Oh, okay. No, I don't think it was like Jello. I was like strawberry jelly. <laughs> Yum. No, I think it's like chemical jelly. Okay, that makes more sense, I suppose. <laughs> Although that would be amazing if he if did. He just like got his like. Hey, yeah, hey, look at this delicious stuff that we're gonna serve in hospitals. Or like injected to donuts. <gasps> right. From a humble start in a small town setting, little did the world know that this imaginative dreamer, Walt, would go on to create a legacy that continues to captivate audiences of all ages 
to this that? day. Walt's early life was marked by a passion for drawing and a relentless pursuit of his artistic ambitions. He often experimented with animation techniques in his school years, particularly his time at McKinley High School in Chicago. Oh, I didn't mm-hmm. realize he went there. He did. Yeah, he was in <laughs> he was in high school like they had moved back from Kansas City to Chicago in 1917 and then he enrolled in McKinley. Oh, okay. He began drawing cartoons for the school newspaper oh, and cool. took art classes while in high school. His continually growing fascination for the world of animation set the stage for his future endeavors. Interesting to note here, during World War I, Walt Disney attempted to enlist oh. and wanted to like fight the Germans, but he was underage. Interesting. Yes. And undeterred, he, he was like, Okay, fine, then I'll figure out another way to do this. He joined the Red Cross and served as an ambulance driver in France for oh, a short wow. time. Yeah. Did any of his siblings fight in the war, do you know? I don't think so. Okay. Not that I read. So this is just like something on his own that he was like, mm-hmm. I gotta do this. He's like, this. I wanna do this. Wow. There wasn't a ton to do, though, because uh, he had arrived after the, after the armistice, which stopped the fighting Got it. there. So there really wasn't like a ton happening at yeah. that time. Not to say there weren't still ambulances and medical attention sure. needed. So yeah, there wasn't a lot to do, but apparently Walt would draw cartoons on the side of his ambulance. Oh, I feel like <laughs> that's a no-no. I don't, yeah, I'm, <laughs> well, Feels like you're not supposed to do that. But maybe, he was a rule breaker. He was, a, he was like, I gotta innovate. <laughs> you gotta break some rules to get ahead. That's drawing. Okay. I assumed. (laughs) The founding of Disney dates back to the early 1920s when Walt Disney, along with Royo, Royo. co-founded what would eventually become the Walt Disney Company. Okay. Walt Disney's early attempt at animation was the creation of a short-lived animation studio called Laughagram Studio in Kansas City. Oh, all right. The studio produced a series of fairy tale based animated shorts, but financial difficulties led to its bankruptcy in 1923. Oh, and so he was, what, early 20s? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He would have been, yeah, like 22 when it got... Well, 1920, he would have been like 19 when he founded it. Oh, my God. I was not on the path to success at 19. (laughs) I was not either. So I want to really quickly mention here, because we're going to talk more about it in a little bit. I wasn't sure where to put this. Okay. But Walt met another animator while he was in Kansas City. Ub Iwelt, I think is his name. His name was Ub. Ub. It's it's short for a longer name, which I'll tell you. But he he essentially worked with Ub on a Laughagram studio. Oh, okay. Um, and like Ub, as a partner, yeah, like okay. as a partner, and Ub and him like created Mickey together. Together, we'll oh. talk more about it. I just wanted to got to it. Point Some that. tells me things didn't go so well between those well, two guys. I think it was on and off, which I'll tell. I'll tell you a little bit more about. I go into Ub a little bit more later. So after Laughagram Studio closed in Kansas City, Walt decided to try his luck in Hollywood, and in 1923, Walt and Roy O founded Disney Brothers Studio in Hollywood. Mm. The first order of business was creating a new character, which was Oswald the Rucky, which was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Oh. The Rucky Rabbit. The Rucky Rabbit. The Rucky Rabbit. I can't, Rabbit. Even, I can't <laughs> even make fun of the way you're saying it without messing it up. Uh, for Universal Studios. Oh, okay. So just to go into a little bit, Walt is, you know, 24 now. He's founding companies and studios. Getting shit done. Oh, someone wants the tickets. Oh, pause. Pause for one second. Yep. Kevin is selling his tickets tonight to a show for Randy Rainbow online, and someone wants them, so he's got to, like, make this deal happen now. He is typing furiously. Uh, He got them. Oh, good. He accepted. He got those tickets. Enjoy the show. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about Walt, where he is personally right now. You know, it's he's 24, yeah. it's 1925. Making he, things happen. Yeah, he's getting shit done. Walt married Lillian Bounds, who okay. was a Disney Studio Inc. and paint artist. Oh. They had two daughters, Diane Marie Disney and Sharon May Disney. Okay. Walt was known to be a pretty family-oriented man. And his daughters often inspired elements in his creative works. Aside from that, Walt had various hobbies and interests that went beyond just animation. He enjoyed trains and built a miniature railroad. 
God, that's a hard word to say. Railroad. Railroad. It, it, it kind of is. Yikes. Rail Miniature rail Miniature Railroad. <laughs> railroad. <laughs> railroad. The Carrollwood Pacific Railroad at his home. Not an actual, like, full-scale railroad. Just, sure. That's what his little model was called. My favorite Christmas gift when I was a very little, little kid uh-huh. was I woke up one morning and there were train tracks around the tree and one of those, like, plastic little train cars. And I could ride around in a circle and I thought it was heaven. That's amazing. It was the best. Congratulations. Thank you. I don't mean that in a mean way. Like, that's really cool. You looked a little upset about it? No, no. I mean, I'm jealous. Like, I never had that. Okay. And that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I don't have it anymore. (laughs) Walt was also an avid collector of miniatures. And as I just said, had a passion for those model trains Mm -hmm. and the little things that went along with them. Mm -hmm. He also had a deep appreciation for nature and wildlife. Okay. And this love for the outdoors influenced some of his animated works, such as Bambi and the True Life Adventure series. I was gonna say I could I could see that in some of those films. Oh, totally. I've never heard of the True Life Adventure series I didn't either. There's a lot that I was looking up that's a lot older that yeah. I think was like more on a smaller scale that maybe we don't have a full sure. picture of. In 1928, the Disney Brothers Studio faced a setback when they lost the rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Because remember that was oh. for Universal. So how do they lose the rights? I mean, they, Disney designed it, but it was for Universal. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I think Universal got all owned the rights. Owned that. Yeah. Be- I mean, they commissioned it. Yeah. But then I am I think they got the rights sure. to it. But yeah, they, they lost the rights to that, which was a setback to them because mm-hmm. that was like the, a character that they created. Yeah. So undeterred. Which is kind of what I love about Disney. It's like everything he did, it was like, okay, on to the next thing then. Oh, okay. It was never like we have a setback. Oh, fuck. You know, let's revel in it. He was like, no, how do we fix it? That's a good quality to have. It is good. I wish I could do that. Undeterred, Walt Disney, along with Ub Iwerks, Ub. created a new character that would become an icon in the world of entertainment. Mickey Mickey Mouse. I shouldn't sing because it is probably copyright. Ub (laughs) Iwerks, whose full name was... Okay. Give it to me. Give me your best shot. Ube Ert Iwerks. (laughs) That sounds fake. I love it. It's U-B-B-E, which to me... But Ube... Isn't that a type of potato? I think like a purple one. Yeah, I think so. Maybe it's Ubba. 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 I like that. Ubba. Whatever it is, I like it. I like the shortened version because I could say it, and I feel like I've heard that name before. Okay. And I could be butchering the fuck out of it, and I don't know. But he's probably dead, so it's probably okay. I think so. He was also an influential American animator, cartoonist, and special effects technician. Oh, all right. He was a key collaborator with Disney in the company's early years. And Walt met Ub while they were working at the Kansas City Film Ad Company in the early 1920s. Mm. And they formed a cl- he formed a close relationship with Ub. And that's when they were involved in the founding of that previous company, Laughagram Studio. Yeah. Ub and Walt worked closely together during those first few years of Disney. But then Ub left Disney in 1930 to start his own company. Uh oh. Which it was iWorks Disney Commercial Artists. Ooh. So he still kind of like kept the name in there. That's I th- weird. I don't think he like fully separated. I think he was just okay. like, I'm going to go out there and try my own thing. Did Walt have any participation in that company? I don't believe he did. But he kept the name? But he That's... kept the name, yeah. So um... he left Dis- Oh, I just said that. But it wasn't as successful as Disney. Mm. And he actually returned to Disney in 1940 and helped with the design of Disneyland. Oh, wow. If I were Walt, I would have held a grudge. I see that too. And I think there's probably a lot more to this. I don't want to say there's a lot more to the story, but I think there's probably some nuances that we're not catching here. From the research I did, I didn't see anything that would really like push me toward the idea of bad blood. Oh, okay. Between them. But that I don't know. Sure. That's I just what I was looking at it. It didn't seem so. And it does say something that he was able to come back to Disney in 1940. Yeah. To help with all this stuff. So it leads me to believe that the relationship didn't go bad. Well, that's good. Yeah. We'll say yeah. 
Uh, he developed, <laughs> but Ub was really great because he developed the first multiplane camera, which added depth to animated scenes. Wow. So this invention revolutionized the animation industry and earned him an Academy Award in 1960. Shit. Mm-hmm. The, here's what's crazy. I have never heard that name. I've heard it. I'm pretty sure Ub Iwerks. Ub okay. Iwerks is like a, that's, I've heard that. I have, I definitely have heard that before. I don't know in what context, Yeah, but when I was reading it, I was like, oh, oh, that sounds familiar for Hmm. some reason. The release of Steamboat Willie in November 1928 marked the debut of Mickey Mouse Mm -hmm. and the beginning of Disney's animation success. Yeah. The animated short Steamboat... Oh my God, I just fucking said that. How stupid am I? Don't be so hard on my friend. I hate myself. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) It's taking a really dark energy no, no, in this no. closet. No, the the energy of the closet is fun. I lit a candle in here earlier because it kind of smelled like feet. Oh, my whole life smells <laughs> like feet. <laughs> I'm sorry, I laughed way too hard at that. No. It's all right. So Steamboat Willie not only was the you know the debut of Mickey Mouse, but this was also showcasing Disney's pioneering use of synchronized sound yeah the disney company kept growing after you know having these successes with characters and in 1932 disney released the first ever full color cartoon flowers and trees oh using the three strip technicolor process don't ask me what that is i okay. didn't look it up okay but it's new and fresh Ooh, and, it and everybody an loves it yeah technicolor Color. Woo. This won an Academy Award that year for Best Short Subject Cartoons. Wow. As Disney's success in animation grew, the studio expanded beyond animated shorts into feature films. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves in 1937 became the first full-length animated feature film showcasing Disney's ability to tell captivating stories through animation. It was a key moment in the history of that company. And was it the first animated feature ever or just for Disney? I think it was just for Disney. Mm -hmm. I don't... Let me look that up real quick, Kate. Okay. I'm curious. What was the first uh, animated feature ever? Phantasmagory in 1908. So no. Ah, okay. For Disney, it was the big gotcha. deal. And also it was Technicolor. Right. And Technicolor was all the Technicolor. rage. Technicolor. Your sweater is a little Technicolor right now. Ooh. I mean. That's that, how Technicolor That's looks. how it affects you. I'm, I'm doing a um, modern dance. You're doing something. <laughs> At this time, since the company was growing, doing so well, putting out all these really great features, Disney adopted a vertically integrated model, which I had to look up what vertical integration was. Mm -hmm. But basically in business, it's like a company that handles everything. So like, like, so they were handling the production, the distribution, the marketing. Oh, okay. They did everything. Normally, like it's a, you know, conglomerate of companies that come together to do this. Production does this. Someone does this. Disney was like, "Uh, uh-uh. uh, we're doing it all. We're gonna wow. make it, market it, send it, distribute it, everything." Goodness. And at that time in the '30s, vertical integration was a relatively uncommon practice for mm-hmm. a company to do, but it proved to be the key, one of the key factors in the success of the studio. Oh wow! Because I feel like that can go either way. See, that's the thing. Like, I could feel like that could like really backfire. Mm-hmm. Because it, it also feels like when you have more irons in the fire, you have better chance for success almost because you have so many different companies kind of. Mm. purporting the same thing. Yeah, and like a little bit more support, I right. would feel. Right, more support, exactly. But Disney had was it, it all. Was it because he was a control freak? You know, I don't think so. I didn't get that vibe from him. Well, I don't know him, but and I didn't work with him. But from what I read. He didn't speak to you from the grave? Oh. That's weird. Kate and I are going to pull out our Ouija board. <sighs> Idea. Do we have a Ouija night and film it? Yes. For the listeners. Yes. Okay. My mom loved Ouija boards, mm-hmm. and she w- she got me one for Christmas that glue in the dark glue glowed. <laughs> and my friends and I, freshman year of college, when I was smoking weeds in the Appalachian hills, in the forest, in the forest, uh, we would go take the Ouija board out there and smoke and oh. like do stuff. We contacted a demon. Once, oh shit! And that demon, and I pull aside your clothes. <laughs> And here he is. Is Rosie O'Donnell. I don't know why it would be Rosie O'Donnell. 
that was just the first name that came into my head. It's wild. I love Rosie O'Donnell. She's my uh, she's an icon. As the studio continued creating successful cartoons, Walt ventured beyond animation and into live action films, television, and theme parks. Oh, wow. The first I don't know why I said, oh, wow. Like, that's the first I ever heard. Oh, my God. Disney made movies in a park? Movies in parks? (laughs) What the fuck? Who knew? (laughs) Oh, my God. The first ever live action Disney movie was Treasure Island, Mm. which was released in 1950 and based on the Robert Louis Stevenson classic novel of the same name. (laughs) <laughs> Your voice just went to like NPR. Now I'm going to sing you a lullaby. Treasure Island was directed by Byron Haskin and was one of the first major productions in this genre for mm. the studio. Kind of action adventure, yeah. live action type thing. A significant milestone in the history of Disney was the opening of Disneyland Ah. on July 17th, 1955 in Anaheim, California. Mm -hmm. Have you been there? Nope. I've been to Disney World. Yeah. Twice. Here's my hot take. Have you been to both? Yes. Okay. And I know that Disneyland is like the first, but Disney World is better. Is it? Yeah. Okay. That makes me feel better. Yeah, you've been to the better one. Okay. (laughs) I love it. Walt wanted to provide a unique and immersive entertainment experience for families, Mm -hmm. specifically. There were several factors that influenced this decision. He wanted a family-friendly amusement park where families could enjoy their time together in a safe environment and a place that could cater to both children and adults, not just be for one age group. He was abused as a child. So as part of his decision so that kids had a safe place, I'm guessing that's part of that is to like make a new world. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Walt was also extremely frustrated with traditional amusement parks at the time. Hmm. He felt that amusement parks in the 1950s were not safe or clean, and there just was not any element of like enchantment that people could experience. I mean, I would say that even today, amusement parks are not safe and clean. I love amusement parks. And I haven't been to them in forever because yeah. I love rides. I used to love roller coasters. Uh, love. Okay. Okay. Love. <laughs> Got it. Sorry. <laughs> Amusement parks are creepy. Just saying. I love it. (laughs) That's where I'm at. I'm creeping. I have a corn dog just creeping around, (laughs) staring at people. (laughs) He used Disneyland to kind of explore new forms of innovation. Got it. Which is what he loved. Mm -hmm. And so he saw a way to blend storytelling and technology and immersive environments to create a unique form of entertainment. It was also a way to bring Disney characters to life and a completely new business venture for Disney at that time. Mm -hmm. So Disney movies were creating beloved characters and the parks were also a way for people to actually interact with them in some way. Uh, creating a real world extension of the animated stories on the business side of Disneyland. Uh, it was the perfect complement to the animation studio. Sure. The park would generate revenue, but it was also its own promotional tool. Yeah. Uh, vertical integration is what I wrote with an exclamation point. <laughs> Walt Disney also had a large interest in urban planning and community design. He used Disneyland as a way to experiment with his ideas related to urban design, uh, transportation systems, and themed environments. EPCOT, which stands for Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. Wait, it stands for something? I had no idea. Yeah, Experimental Prototype Community of Tomorrow. There you go. I'm learning so many things. Yay. (laughs) It was an extension of his interest. Like, he was into all of this planning and yeah. revitalization. However, this only evolved into a theme park concept after his passing. It, oh. it was kind of supposed to be something that he wanted to see through as, like, you know, an experimentation with urban design. Yeah. But it then it sort of just became a park about kind of that subject. I see. So it would have been interesting to know, like, what he would have taken, where he would have taken that. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm interested. I'm curious. Today, there are six Disney uh, Disney resorts worldwide. I actually thought there were more. Disneyland, Walt Disney World, Tokyo Disney, Disneyland Paris, Hong Kong Disneyland, 
and Shanghai Disney Resort. Hmm, worldwide. The founding of Disney marked the beginning of a journey that would transform the entertainment industry, and Walt Disney's creativity and dedication to storytelling laid the foundation for a company that would become a global entertainment giant later. Here we get into the shit. Here's the shit. Okay, I some was of waiting. It. Some was of waiting. it. I mean, I know it was a lot, but I feel like... No, you gotta have the background. Yeah, I needed a, more of a background on him. But this is where we get into the kind of nitty gritty of the things that might not be so great. Let's dive into the conspiracies and accusations. Walt Disney has faced accusations of holding anti-Semitic views, particularly during the 1940s. Some critics pointed to his association with certain individuals and groups known for anti-Semitic sentiments. That's not great. For example, during the 1940s, he was associated with the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. Wait, wasn't that the whole like communist thing so yeah we'll talk we'll get into okay that. Mm -hmm. uh, an organization that included members with conservative and anti-communist views mm. some of whom were accused of anti-semitism it's also noted that there were accusations from former employees who claimed that disney made anti-semitic remarks or held prejudiced views i want to mm. say here that disney was very conservative mm. like a hardcore conservative yeah and was loud about it. Yeah. And also, here's the thing, though, Kate. Like, I want to say that these things are also hearsay. There's not really, there's not, like, documented evidence of all of this. Okay. It's like, oh, he said this, or I heard him say this. Or okay. he, does that make sense? Or he, like, sure. was around these people, and he went with this crowd. And but that's I know that he thought. was also, like, a tyrant among his employees and, like, would just... And we'll get into Rage that because there's a them. whole there's a whole thing about labor. Yeah, that we went into. He was anti-union. Yeah, yeah. So one quote attributed to Walt Disney suggests anti-Semitic views. Quote: The Jews are responsible for ninety percent of the problems in this world. Oh my goodness. Unquote. However, the accuracy of this quote is disputed, and there is debate over whether it reflect reflects Disney's actual beliefs. I mean, I don't know how. It would not reflect any beliefs, but some argue that it's not verifiable and it may be a misattribution. I just need to hmm. say that. Sure. Some of Disney's early animated works have been criticized for perpetuating racial stereotypes. Mm -hmm. These depictions reflect the prevailing attitudes of the time, but are considered offensive by contemporary standards. Again, I'm saying it's like that of the time. Thing. Right, right, right. This was offensive at the this wasn't offensive at the time. Do you have examples? Oh, I have uh, many examples, Kate. And we'll get into them. Great. The early to mid 20th century was marked by racial and cultural insensitivity in popular media. Stereotypes and caricatures of various ethnic groups were unfortunately commonplace in mm -hmm. cartoons, films, and other forms of entertainment. Let's get into them. Okay. Steamboat Willie, 1928. Mm -hmm. Some early Disney cartoons, such as Steamboat Willie, have been criticized for portraying racial stereotypes. In this one, there are scenes that depict offensive portrayals of African American, African and African American characters. Mm. In the Three Little Pigs, the Big Bad Wolf is depicted with Jewish stereotypes. Oh, which I has never been, realized that. Yeah, which has been criticized as perpetuating negative and offensive images. Oh, wow. 1940s Fantasia. In the original release of Fantasia, there's a character named Sunflower, which is a small, dark-skinned uh, centaurette. And Sunflower's character perpetuated racial stereotypes and was later edited out of the film in subsequent releases. Oh, interesting. Dumbo, 1941. One notable scene in Dumbo involves a group of crows that speak and behave in a manner reminiscent of racial stereotypes. The leader of the crows is even named Jim Crow. Oh, that's a term weird. associated with racial segregation laws in the United States. Oh, Jim wow. Crow laws. Crows are using African American vernacular English, A A V E, and their design and mannerisms perpetuate certain racial mm -hmm. stereotypes. The portrayal of the crows has been viewed as insensitive and sparked discussions about this kind of thing in classic animated films. Mm -hmm. uh, Song of the South in 1946. Already by the title, I'm like, that's going to be. One of the most controversial Disney films is Song of the South. The film has been criticized for its portrayal of African-American characters and its romanticized depiction of the post-Civil War South. Mm -hmm. And due to its controversial content, the film has been made, has not been made available for home viewing in the United States for many years. I was going to say, I hadn't even heard of it. Right. So I think they scrapped that one pretty quickly yeah. after figuring out what happened. And then again, in Peter Pan in 1953... 
This film has been criticized for containing racially insensitive depictions of Native American characters. Mm. I think I'm behind on the correct term for what we call indigenous people in the area that we live in. I think Native American might be a, a term that's not used anymore. That's a great question. I don't know the I answer I don't to know that. either. I think, can I look it up real quick? Yeah. Do you mind if I look it up? The terms American Indian or indigenous American are preferred by many Native people. Okay. All right. I'll say indigenous Americans. Okay. So the film has been criticized for containing racially insensitive depictions of indigenous Americans. The portrayal of the indigenous characters includes elements such as exaggerated accents, mm. simplistic and stereotypical behaviors, and the use of terms like red man and red skins. Ah. The song, What Made the Red Man Red, Ooh. in the film has been particularly criticized for perpetuating yeah. indigenous American stereotypes. I will say also that today Disney has added content disclaimers on its streaming platform, Disney+, Plus, warning viewers about outdated cultural depictions in some of the older films. I mean, that's a step. Mm -hmm. Disney not only perpetuated some stereotypes, but was accused of exploiting his workforce. In 1941, there were labor strikes at the Disney studio. Animators, writers, and other staff went on to strike to protest low wages and poor working conditions. Ooh. The primary issue was the demand for the recognition of the Screen Cartoonist Guild as the bargaining agent for the Disney artists. SCG was the labor union representing the animation industry at the time and sought to establish itself at Disney. Mm, okay. The guild aimed to address the issues of low wages, long working hours, and the lack of job security. Yeah. This was also part of a broader movement at the time within the broader animation industry during the late 1930s and early 1940s. So it wasn't just Disney that was like yeah. mistreating people. But I'm guessing Walt wasn't super excited about this guild. Not at all. He was pretty furious about it. Walt Disney opposed the unionization of his employees, viewing it as a threat to his creative control. Just that sentence alone, no, creative control, no. I hate that. Yeah, so you, I think you can kind of garner from that sentence what kind yeah. of an environment it was to yeah. work with him. He thought this could potentially lead to disruptions in production. So Walt Disney's strong opposition to unions and his involvement in anti-union activities during this period were contentious. Sure. In 1941, a group of animators at Disney formed the Cartoonists Strike Committee to advocate for the recognition of the Screen Cartoonists Guild. Good for them. Yeah. Disney did the not so great thing of firing several of the key union activists. Of course. Which only added flames to added wood to the fire and further escalated the tensions. Yeah. So on May 28th, 1941, the workers went on a full on strike, demanding the fired employees be reinstated and also for union recognition and improved working conditions. The strike lasted for several weeks, with okay. picket lines forming outside of the Disney studio. The dispute caused major disruptions to the animation production schedule. The strike ended with some some concessions from Disney, okay. but it also left lasting tensions at yeah. the company. Yeah, I feel like that would be hard to go back to work after that. Yeah, I, you know, he did not officially recognize the Screen Cartoonist Guild, but he did make certain improvements, like instituting a grievance system and addressing specific concerns raised by the strikers. I'm not saying he did everything good. I think he sure. could have done a lot more, but I think he gave them like the bare minimum. Mm. And they came back to work. Now we're on to communism. Oh, bring on the commies. Red Scare. Yeek. During the Cold War era and the McCarthy era of the 1940s and 50s, there was a great deal of suspiciones. Suspicion. <laughs> and <laughs> It took me a second. I don't know why I said it like that. During the So during this time, there was a great deal of suspicion and fear of communism in the United States. Walt Disney was associated with anti-communist sentiments and mm. openly cooperated with anti-communist movements. In 1947, Disney testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, mm. which was a congressional committee investigating alleged communist influence in the entertainment industry. Yeah. Disney, it's come up in a few episodes now, has, actually. It actually. Yeah, we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's Hollywood. Right. This was like because the entertainment industry, that's kind of the thing that it glommed onto, right? Because yep. it was the founder of the Hollywood Reporter. Right. That's right. Yep. 
It's all coming back <laughs> to me now. Disney and other Hollywood bigwigs were asked to provide info about individuals with suspect communist affiliations. This is so shitty. Disney took direct measures to distance himself from individuals that were perceived as having communist sympathies. Mm. Some employees, including several animators, were let go from Disney during this period due to accusations of being pro-communist. That's the thing. So many people lost their jobs. Their livelihoods. Because of this. Yeah. I mean, like families were ruined. It was just awful. This loops back into the Disney strike in 1941 because while the strike wasn't directly related to communism, Mm -hmm. it led to the tensions and some of those participants were later accused of having communist leanings during the anti-communist investigation. Because while maybe he didn't hold a grudge against Ub, but he held a grudge against those workers. Yeah, and then they were dealt with later because he's like, oh, well, I guess you're pro-commie. Yep, and he said bye. The animation industry, including Disney, has faced criticism for gender inequality. Mm. Some accounts... I said that like Mara Rose. Some (laughs) accounts, Kate. Some accounts suggest that women working at Disney in its early years faced challenges and were underrepresented in creative roles. I mean, yep. (laughs) Yep. With limited access to positions such as animators or directors. Mm. Of course, the industry was extremely male-dominated in the early to mid-20th century. Throughout much of Walt Disney's early history, women faced great challenges in obtaining prominent roles within the creative and executive spheres of the company, Mm -hmm. which I kind of just said. Oh, so in her speech at the Board of Review Awards Gala in January 2014, Oh, recent. Famed actress Meryl Streep Meryl made, made some choice comments about Walt Disney. What did she say? She was presenting an award to Emma Thompson, who played P.L. Travers in the film Saving Mr. Banks. Yes, I worked on that movie. Oh my God. We'll talk about it later. Okay. This movie depicts the behind the scenes story of the making of Disney of Disney's Mary Poppins. She criticized Walt's alleged anti Semitic views and gender bias, mentioning some quotes attributed to Disney that were considered not so great including the quote i read earlier about mm-hmm. the anti-semitism meryl speaking the truth she came out and was like ah let me tell you yep there were claims that walt disney made remarks that suggest gender bias sure for example it said that he once stated i prefer to hire boys girls cause too much drama Ugh. again i have to say the accuracy and context of such quotes are debated and the veracity of these statements is uncertain but we can clearly see gender bias yeah and i mean his behavior kind of speaks volumes even if those weren't his exact words it's not like you can't discern that yeah from what's happening streep also spoke about the lack of strong female characters in disney films Mm. these comments sparked a lot of discussion about what Walt actually meant and in the context of the time in which he lived. Critics argued that Streep's remarks oversimplified and misrepresented Disney's legacy. I'm not going either way. I think we can see where it was and yeah. how it was being treated. I think we're all making our we're own. We're all making our own assumptions. Drawing our own conclusions, conclusions here. Our listeners are smarties. They know what's going on. You guys get it. However, the criticism that Meryl Streep cast on Walt is backed up. Yeah. (laughs) There is a well-known... Oh, shit. This is insane. There is a well-known rejection letter attributed to Walt Disney from 1938 that was in response to a woman named Mary V. Ford who applied for a position as an animator at Walt Disney Productions. The letter got a lot of attention because it exemplifies the challenges that women faced in breaking into certain professions in that era, especially, again, as the creative roles as animators. Mm Mm-hmm. Here is that letter. I don't know if I'm ready for this. Dear Miss Ford, your letter of recent date has been received in the inking and painting department for reply. Women do not do any of the creative work in connection with preparing the cartoons for the screen. <laughs> as that task is performed entirely by young men. Oh my God. For this reason, girls are not considered for the training school. The only work open to women consists of tracing the characters on clear celluloid sheets with India ink and then filling in the tracing on the reverse side with paint according to directions. 
In order to apply for a position as anchor or painter, it is necessary that one appear at the studio bringing samples of pen and ink and watercolor work. It would not be advisable to come to Hollywood with the above specifically in view, as there are really very few openings in comparison with the number of girls who apply. Yours very truly, Walt Disney Productions Limited. Sorry. I tried to read that as condescending as possible. I had to barf in the middle of it. I'm sorry. Oh, gross. You can hear some tracing paper if you want to trace. Can you copy that line? Good girl. Walt Disney passed away on December 15th, 1966 at the age of 65. The cause of his death was complications related to lung cancer. Disney had been a heavy smoker for many Mm. years and his health had been declining. He was diagnosed with lung cancer in November 1966 and just a few weeks later, he he succumbed to acute circulatory collapse as a result of the cancer. That happened fast. Yeah. Walt Disney's death marked the end of an era for the entertainment industry as he had played a pioneering role in the world of animation and theme parks. Despite his passing, the legacy of the Walt Disney Company has continued to thrive and expand, becoming a global entertainment conglomerate. Roy O. Disney continued to lead the company after Walt's death. Oh, okay. Overseeing the completion and opening of Walt Disney World in Florida in 1971. Ah, all right. The Walt Disney Company has continued to grow and diversify its entertainment offerings, acquiring Marvel, Pixar, Lucasfilm, which is Star Wars, Mm -hmm. and 20th Century Fox, among others. Just swallowing up all other companies. companies. (laughs) I will dominate. Conglomerate. I'm the vertical conglo- integration. Vertical integration, everyone. Yikes! Yikes! Can that be a T-shirt? Vertical integration. Yikes! <laughs> it's really colored. Start designing it. Yes. <laughs> Let me contact Amazon. That was a joke. Was One ready. of the most. I was ready to look up the contact info. Here's the website. Here's the address. All right. Here's the website. <laughs> Who doesn't know what the website for Amazon is? Where are we going? I don't know. I'm here. I'm ready. One of the most enduring and debunked theories is that Walt Disney's body was cryogenically frozen mm-hmm. after his death in 1966 with the hope of being revived in the future. This theory likely stems from the fact that Disney was fascinated by technological innovations, sure. but there is no evidence to support the idea that his body was frozen. The Disney family has consistently denied any involvement in cryonics or the freezing of Disney's body. Disney on ice could have taken a whole new meaning. <gasps> That's funny, Kate. It wasn't that funny. And pro- I'm sure someone no, has I said love it before. That. I'm sure I'm not the first to say it. Walt Disney was cremated and his ashes were interred at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. So many people are in Forest That's Lawn. That. Yeah, we. I've mentioned that before. You it's, have too. It's, yeah, it's like it, half the people we've talked about are in Forest Lawn. <laughs> we need to go there. We will. Okay. We'll be buried there. I don't want to be buried there. I don't either. Cremate me. And then dump me on the floor of a seedy gay bar. His final resting place is a marked grave. There's also a rumor slash conspiracy that Walt Disney was involved in Freemasonry, pointing to various symbols and alleged connections in Disney films and theme parks. It's reaching, but can you I explain to bring... what Freemasonry yes, I will. is? I, okay. I look. I've heard a lot about it. It's very confusing, but. Freemasonry, at a simplified explanation, is a fraternal organization that traces its roots to medieval stonemason guilds. Oh. It is characterized by rituals, symbols, and traditions. Freemasonry promotes moral and ethical development, brotherhood, and charity. So it's a cult. Your words, not mine. I mean, is it? I don't know anything about Freemasonry, but it sounds like it. Pretty much. I, I would love to do a deeper dive into it. There's a lot of pod and and that's what we drink does a really good uh, oversight or overview of Freemasonry in like over a couple of episodes. Yeah, take with that uh, what you will. It's a lot of weird okay. symbolism, a, a lot of strange underground practices type things. Okay. Um, members are organized into lodges, and the organization is known for its emphasis on secrecy. 
However, these Freemason claims lack any credible evidence and are often based on misinterpretations of symbols in Disney's creative mm, works. Okay. Some theorists have pointed to the use of certain symbols in Disney's films and theme parks, suggesting a connection to Freemasonry. However, many symbols, such as the all-seeing eye or the square and compass, have cultural and historical significance that go beyond Freemasonry. I see. Because I was going to ask like, if there are specific films films that have a symbol that oh, stands out probably i didn't look into okay. that um, but that would be an interesting thing to dive into like cult or these symbols throughout media history mm. and entertainment there's probably a lot so there's also club 33 have you heard of club 33 i've been to club oh 33. my god tell me all about it i don't know why i said it like <laughs> all tell about me all it. about it kate <laughs> yeah it's supposedly very secretive mm. i can't remember if it was a password or like what it was to get in Supposedly, back in the day, okay. above all the tables, Walt had installed microphones oh. to, like, listen in and eavesdrop on people and, like, find out what he could find out. And it's one of those things where it's only cool because they don't let everybody in. Yeah. You know what I it's mean? It's exclusive. Yeah. But I did keep the, I have, like, a little napkin from there, and I have, it's either a pencil or a pen. I think it's a pen. It says Club 33 on it. <gasps> Kate, I kept you've been to an exclusive area of I mean, Disneyland. Wow, wow. It's, no, I think it's amazing. It's kind of dumb. It costs like thousands upon thousands to be a member there. Oh, I've got some numbers here. Okay, let's hear them. Yeah, so the Club 33, which Kate is talking about, uh, is an exclusive members only club located in the heart of the New Orleans sector of Disneyland's Adventureland. And its entrance features a plaque with the number 33. It's mm -hmm. not like a grand entrance. Oh, it's not at all. It's like very, you would, you, if you didn't know it was there, you'd walk right past it. Yeah. Some theorists have speculated that the number 33 and the Masonic symbols in indicate a connection to Freemasonry, hmm. including Walt Disney's rumored status as a 33rd degree Mason. There's a ton of different degrees in okay. secret, secret, secrets. However, Club 33's theme and design are more closely related to its New Orleans Square location and Walt Disney's interest in creating an upscale venue. Mm. Members pay a purported $50,000 initiation yeah, it's fee insane. and annual membership of $15,000. Mm -hmm. Membership is capped at a few hundred individuals, so it can take a while to get in. Mm -hmm. The club was opened on June 15th, 1967, and is a mecca of privacy for wealthy people visiting the park. There have been lawsuits about the denial of membership or having membership suspended. People mm. sued Disneyland because they either got kicked out or they weren't allowed to join for whatever reason. Oh, wow. I looked into those things mm -hmm. and... To what it sounded like to me was that, you know, rich people being mad, they can't just do whatever they want. Right. That's what it sounds like. Uh, celebrities such as Johnny Depp, Kanye West, and Kim Kardashian have been members. They weren't there when I was there. No. <laughs> just FYI. <laughs> As we reflect on Walt Disney's life, it's essential to explore the lasting impact he left on the world. Uh, his legacy is multifaceted. His innovations in animation, theme park design, and storytelling techniques laid the foundation for the Disney empire. Even today, his influence resonates in every Disney film, theme park attraction, and the countless people who go to those parks and see those movies. Yeah. But also, there's, you know, he was a far right, tough, intense, it's like what we hard working individual kind of have been talking about. I can't remember what episode it was on, but talking about the art versus the artist. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it is again. Yeah. Yeah. Disney films and movies have such a a huge place in our culture. It's almost yeah. like a cultural phenomenon. Well, there's that huge exhibit right now that yeah. I looked into for us because yeah. it's only here and I think in Australia or something. It's only like two places. It's the like 100 years of Disney or whatever mm -hmm. and people say it's like this amazing exhibit but it was kind of pricey and Ooh. I was like, oh, I don't really, Maybe I can't not. afford that. Yeah. So that's it, Kate. That's uh, an exploration of the life of the legendary Walt Disney. This has kind of only scratched the surface. I'm sorry, Frankie's scratching. So if you're hearing that, that's just my, my dog. That's the demon I wanting... summoned with the Ouija board when I was 19. Just wanting to come in and say hello. 
Hi. And uh, you can leave your comments. I was going to say questions, comments, concerns uh, on Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube at Horrorwood Podcast. Or you can shoot us an email at Horrorwoodpodcast at gmail.com. And if you're feeling so inclined, you can head on over to Patreon where I'm working on a case right now that I'm, I've learned more about this person than I ever would care to. Oh, shit. Yeah, but anyway, you can head on over to Patreon. Or what's the website? <laughs> Patreon.com slash Horrorwood Podcast. That's your part. Here we go. Okay. You can say it. <laughs> but I, I couldn't. I physically You're could like, not get the words like, out. <laughs> Patreon. Like, what's, dot... what's the website? That is. <laughs> no, it's no, Patreon.com. Patreon.com <laughs> slash Horrorwood Podcast. H O R R O R W O O D P O D C A S T. You spelled that really quickly and well. Thank you. You're welcome. I used to win spelling bees. Thank you.